I'm glad you're all here as uh, we, uh, have, we uh, plunge into the Christmas season, I guess. <laughs> we already decorated for Christmas like a week and a half ago. I was feeling very Christmassy this year. No, it's so right. <laughs> Ira, you don't put your Christmas tree up until December 24th. <laughs> and then <laughs> but yeah, so it's Christmassy. It's Christmas season now. Uh, I'm going to open this up in a word of prayer, and then we'll get started with a song. Uh, dear Lord, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for uh, just everyone that's able to be here. I thank you for those who aren't able to be here as well, that they're able to uh, just uh, watch on the stream. I just pray that you would uh, give us a, just a blessed time together as family and friends and uh, just our church body. I thank you for this building where it's warm. I pray that we would give you our all in our worship this morning. Amen. Please stand as we sing Joy to the World. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him room. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and heaven and nature sing. Joy. You can have a seat. Here comes Scrooge. Well, technically, I'm starting the Christmas series today, so. So when he said, well, I decorated for Christmas, I'm like, that's okay. He said, we can have a go. I'm like, that's not okay. No, 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 no. So. All right, well, we welcome you here this morning. We're glad you're here today, and uh, we are kind of starting the Christmas season, even though Advent doesn't actually start till next week because Christmas is a little later this year, uh, a little more time between Thanksgiving and Christmas this year. Uh, but we've had, a lot, we ha we've had a lot going on, we have a lot going on, and uh, so the first big thing is on Thursday, we had Thanksgiving here. And uh, we had a, a huge turnout, and uh, so uh, we, we estimate, we, didn't have, we don't have an official count, but we estimate that we had about 130 people that got meals, and that doesn't count the, the workers. So Isaac and Christy are going to come up, but if you helped in some way, whether you came and served or whether you cooked, please stand at this time. Please stand if you helped out. And Isaac and Christy are going to come and say a few words. So this was a phenomenal event. Um, we had a lot of people. We had a lot of new faces. And um, I want to give a shout out to all the volunteers. Um, we had people that came before and went to their own Thanksgiving dinners to come help. Um, we had a lot of people that came and helped during, and 
on the end of it. People showed up at the end to help, which is always really great to finish an event with lots of help. Um, just very, very big shout out to all the help. It made it a great event and um, made it really good for all the volunteers. And a special thanks to Greg, of course, because we could not have done any of it without him. Mm. So thank you, thank you, thank you, Greg. You are amazing. Thank you for letting us tag on to your event. Well, not your event, but your event to help and make it a success. We love <laughs> you and thank you. <laughs> yes. So and thanks. also save the date for New Year's Eve because we've got something fun coming up. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, we want to especially thank, thank all the Ratcliffs, but especially Greg because that man can cook. Oh, man. So, all right. Uh, so now, coming up, uh, there's no nursing home service today. They've got COVID issues going on there. So there will be no nursing home service today. Men's breakfast is coming up on December 9th. So December 9th, Saturday at 8 a.m. is men's breakfast. We'd love to have you come. And then the women are going to change it up for, for uh, December. And so they're having a women's brunch at 10 a.m. Not going to get up early this time. So, all right, I hear some people are happy with that. So, wow, who knew? Now, now, here's the funny part. I saw a post on social media a couple weeks ago, and it was saying, you know, churches shouldn't have men's breakfast at 8 o'clock. Uh, men need work all week, and they need to sleep in on the weekends. They don't want to get up early. And I'm like, yeah, but most of the guys want to be there at 8 because they got things to do. And uh, so then, next thing I know, it's the ladies who move theirs. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, okay. Now, I am sympathetic. I think 10 o'clock is plenty early, just saying. So anyway, uh, if you'd like to, there's a sign-up sheet in the lobby if you'd like to help with the ladies' luncheon. Uh, ladies' brunch, sorry, brunch, 10 o'clock. It's not lunch, it's brunch, uh, 10 o'clock. Um, once again this year, we are going to do meal giveaways for the holiday season, uh, for the Christmas season. Uh, so we give what we did last year is we gave out complete meal bags. So each bag had a complete meal in it um, that people could pick up. And uh, we, we gave, a, I don't remember exactly how many what we did last year. Do you remember? 30 last year. So, um, and my guess is we'd like to do at least that many this year. Um, so we need your help to do this. Uh, so if you can, if you want to do a whole bag, uh, you can do that, do an entire meal. Um, or if you can just do parts of one, like just a, ch a chicken or a ham, uh, rolls, vegetable, dessert, or you donate money uh, for a meal, or you can volunteer to help pack the bags, there is a sign-up sheet in the lobby. The pickup will be on December 15th from 3 to 6.30. So this is just, all these are ways that we um, can serve our community. And one of the things that we heard again and again from people even here at the Thanksgiving, uh, which was just really amazing, is just uh, how much it was nice to be able to come and be with other people and just be together as, as kind of an extended family, even if they were not part of our church. And we had a lot of people who aren't part of our church that came. And uh, so it's funny because I was just talking to someone the other day about this because uh, I've had two more Thanksgivings. I had another Thanksgiving on Friday. And then I had another, we have another family Thanksgiving yesterday because I got my son here for the weekend, which was totally cool. And uh, so we've, I've had plenty of Thanksgiving, and almost all of it was the food from Thursday because uh, there was so much food. It was great. Um, but the one thing we talked about is in this day and age, one of the things that people talk about is that people don't go to church anymore and that church is not vital to people's lives and people are not interested in going to church. And so I talked to, I, you know, sometimes hang out and uh, talk to pastors and listen to other pastors in my circles. And it's uh, very common for them to complain and moan and bemoan the, the, the fact that, boy, you just can't get people to go to church anymore. And what we keep finding here is, amazingly enough, we don't have a, a well-oiled outreach uh, system as far as we're not going door-to-door, -door, we're not passing out tracts, we're not... All we're doing is being caring. And it's amazing how... When you're caring and your community knows that you care, people just show up. And we have people just walk through the door. And it's because people want to be cared for. People want to know that they're loved. And when we do that, they find Jesus. So 
that's what we're going to keep doing. And we're so thankful for all of you who help with that. And if you aren't helping with that, we'd love to have your help uh, because there's so much we are able to do when we work together. All right, I want to read this to you. Uh, Attention, friends of Beans Corner Baptist Church. We're excited to announce that the band members boom, 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 of BCBC and their families are taking their musical skills out on the road for one night only this Christmas season, Friday, December 15th, around 4.30. That's right. We're going Christmas caroling around Farmington, Chesterville, and surrounding areas. This is where you come in. Do you know someone who needs a little extra Christmas cheer? Have someone you would like us to stop by and sing a song to? I see you fix that. So. <laughs> We would love to uh, spread a little extra cheer for those in need. Please send any one of us a private message letting us know whose house we should go to, why and where they live. We can't guarantee we'll make it to every house, but we sure will try. And I have Olivia's phone number here. Because we're on the stream, I won't read it out loud because Olivia might get all kinds of cool calls. Um, but it's up here, or you can uh, contact any of them on social media or whatever, or just come up and talk to them. But we're excited about that, and you probably would accept background singers if somebody wanted to sing along. All right, yeah, so if you want to uh, join in the singing part, uh, just talk to Olivia. That's Olivia. She's waving. So, all right. Also, um, on December, so Christmas Eve is December 24th. We'll have our normal Sunday morning service, and then we'll have a Christmas Eve service uh, on Christmas Eve night. All right, so morning service, normal, Christmas Eve service. Um, it's probably 6 p.m. usually, I think, on Christmas Eve evening. Um, but the week before, on the 17th, we are going to have, there's been a, so much going on. Uh, boy, pray for Spruce Mountain. Uh, TJ was here first service, and man, they've just had a time. Um, just, you know, lost a student with an accident this past week, and they had the intruder. And of course, then we've all been through the, the living adjacent to Lewiston and, and the, the, the shooting down there. And so it's just been a lot of time, and a lot of people have gone through a lot. So on the 17th, we're going to have an evening service of, of um, some worship, some prayer, uh, praying for one another. Uh, the, the focus is on comfort and even some lament. So we'd love to have you here on the 17th for an evening service. So you've got a couple weeks in a row for an evening service on the 17th and again on the 24th. Hope that you'll uh, choose to be with us. We'd love to have you here and invite others, especially if you have... Uh, people who are just struggling and, and feel like, hey, I could really use some prayer just in a quiet time of reflection and, and uh, prayer and peace. That will be f Sunday, December 17th at 6 p.m. I think that's everything. Oh, no, it's one more. Rick Simino said, don't forget. And I just remembered. Uh, we are also sponsoring, last year we sponsored a few families for Christmas, uh, families that really didn't have the ability to like get their their kids' Christmas gifts and stuff. We are planning on sponsoring four families this year um, from the community. So if you'd be willing to help with that, please uh, reach out to Rick Simino. If you don't know how to do that, just call the office. Beth will point you in the right direction. But uh, we'd like to do that again. It's been a major way, again, we can love our community. I think that's everything. And so now we're going to um, take our offering. Hmm? So, and then we're going to sing some more.
Please stand as we continue our time of worship together.
This one is a, uh, it's not a new song, like, time-wise, but like, it's a song that I don't believe we've sung here before. It's called Mighty is the Power of the Cross. It's got a really good message. I want to, there's a little bit of a, there's like two lines with an echo on the bridge, so I just wanted to play it really quick so you could hear it, but I'm just going to, I'll sing both parts and we'll learn it as we go in the future, because I can't, I can't teach everything perfectly, first try, everything, but I just wanted you to hear it. Um, the bridge sounds like it's a miracle to me it's a miracle to me and it's still a mystery and it's still a mystery it's a miracle to me and that'll come in the bridge but now you've heard it so we can play through it together <laughs> from 
Children, come on down. Good morning. You're tired. Yes. I had a busy weekend with all the holidays. You guys get a lot of food this weekend? Did you eat pie? Do you guys like pie? Everything. Yes. Yeah, pie. Yes, we've had a lot of pie. All right, so I have a song. I don't know if you know it, but if you know it, I want you to sing it with me. We're only going to sing a couple. We're going to sing the whole song. I'm sure the adults know it. I don't know if you know it, but we'll, we'll try it out. All right, I'll start. If you know it, you can join me. So you'd better not pout. No, you better watch out. You better not cry. You better not pout. I'm telling you why. Santa Claus is coming to town. And then we'll skip to my favorite part. He sees you when you're sleeping. He knows if you're awake. He knows if you've been bad or good, so be good for goodness sake. Whoa. So Santa is watching. Yes. You ever think about that? Oh, my word. That's kind of a scary song. I'm like, wait a minute. You see me when I'm sleeping? Like when I sleep, you know what happens? You know, like I'll start snoring and then I drool. I don't want you, wa I don't want you watching me while I sleep. It's like, don't, 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 don't look. I'm not, you know, when you're sleeping, you're not very pretty. You're like, <laughs> you know, so, yeah, you don't want somebody watching you then. I'm like, Santa, just go away, go away, go away, yeah. you know. But, boy, that that's, sounds like kind of pressure, doesn't it? Now, if I was watching, if I, if I followed you around all the time and just watched you all the time, would you like that? Probably not. But now, hey, if I just, you guys came up here and I just turned around and I just looked back here and I didn't look at you at all and didn't pay any attention to you, would you like that? Yeah. You would? <laughs> yeah, I heard some no's. Yeah, that would be kind of rude, wouldn't it, to not even look at you? I, I, you wouldn't like that if I didn't talk to you or I talked to you but wouldn't even look, look you in the face or whatever. So, so there's, there's kind of good watching, right? And then there's kind of <laughs> bad watching that we don't like. And, and then if you're doing something that you probably shouldn't do, you definitely don't want someone watching you like if you snuck a cookie. Now, I have a confession. Now, we went to Thanksgiving here on Thursday. Really? Oh, my. Well, I tell you, on Friday, we went to a second Thanksgiving, and my friend was cutting the turkey, and the turkey had a lot of, like, really nice golden skin, and I really liked the skin. And he was putting it on the plate so that we could put it on the table so we could eat it. And uh, then when nobody was looking, I snuck a piece. And I ate it. And then his wife turned around, and I was chewing. And she was like, and I'm like, I... Because I didn't want anyone to see me. Now, does God, does God watch us? Yeah. Yes. Now, does he watch us because he loves us? 
Yes. Now, does he also see us when we do things wrong? Yes. Yeah. All right. So, yeah, he's watching all the time. Now, well, yeah, he's kind of like because God is really real. And he's watching. But the main reason he watches us is because he loves us. Now, is that cool? Do you like to know that God can always see you and always care for you? Does that sound good like that? You know, most kids like that because they say, hey, I know that God can see me, that he loves me. But, you know, a lot of grown-ups, when they hear that God's always watching, they don't think, oh, it loves me. They think, oh, no, it, he's watching what I'm doing and I'm going to get in trouble. And so a lot of times when we get bigger, we start thinking about being seen as a bad thing because we think God's going to catch us. Now, does he see us when we do wrong? Yes, he does. But does he watch us because he loves us? Yes, because he wants, just like I love you guys, and so I want to see you. I want to talk to you face to face. And God loves us that way. And sometimes when we get bigger, a lot of times when we're your guys' age, we, we know that, but then when we get bigger, adults start worrying that God's watching, not because he loves us, but because he's trying to catch you. And that's not why he watches us. He watches us because he loves us, and he wants to be face to face with us, like a friend, because God cares about us. What do you think? I see some hands. I don't know if you want to ask a question or have a comment. Yes. Is that why he wasn't at the so, well, I'm sure, but I don't think he minds. What? Like under the couch, he can still see you. That's right. Yeah, it, it, it defies the law of physics, so I'm not even going to get into that today. You guys can go to Children's Church. You guys have been awesome. Thank you so much. You know how God is everywhere? Mm hmm He's in your Mm-hmm. Oh, it's Card Sunday, so bigger kids can go too. I don't think that's how that works either. <laughs> All right, I do not think we have a reader today, right? I forgot. I meant to ask somebody. Oops, but we're not up to reading anyway, so it doesn't matter. All right. Our discussion question today, what is our God, God's? What is God? What are God's? But notice it's lowercase g, usually like. So we've, you know, you encounter a lot of gods throughout culture, throughout history, and there are still different God or gods today. And we just know we're going to be respectful of the various beliefs that people may have. Um, but as you've thought about God, you know, the gods in history and the di different gods or God that you've encountered, what, what are they like? What's, and it's kind of open-ended. So, yes. Um, a lot of them are angry or vindictive. Um, and a lot of them are extremely extremely human with superpowers hmm like superhumans other thoughts i think today you see most people god is money mm -hmm. <laughs> and you see a lot of people getting in trouble because they they've taken money that they shouldn't have had <laughs> yeah yeah other people's <laughs> mm. and then you see these people oh something happened to me oh i'm gonna sue you and you and you and you and you the little Bible says there's no way I'm supposed to sue. Not nice. <laughs> but I think I was talking about a Christian, so you can sue everybody else you want to. <laughs> I'm not sure that's how that works. No, but. No, I think so. <laughs> but I think our God is the best, the great God, the only God. But it's hard to convince people of that because they, they, they want something that they can do, like we say. Mm. They want to do something that earns their God's favor. Mm. And we can't do that anything. Mm. We, can't, we can't earn God's favor. We just have to let him help us. Mm. And he's very good at helping us in spite of it all. Mm. Don't give away my whole sermon, though. Okay. <laughs> oh, yes. 
I think most gods you've heard of in the past have had to be appeased somehow, mm. either by sacrifice or by um, your acts, how you do it or what you give to them. Um, and uh, luckily our god isn't like that. <laughs> <laughs> Other thoughts on gods? So anything can be kind of a god if you are giving it more attention than God. Mm. Mm. Yeah, the, like uh, as Sharon was saying, with money. So, other thoughts, especially on thinking back over like human history and back in the old, back in the old days, I mean the old days, I don't mean your old days, I mean like back in early civilizations and things. Mm. <clears throat> they used to have like objects and idols that mm -hmm. they would worship. Mm. Um, mm. There's different types of like like Vikings believe in different gods than we do. Mm. Um, and then there's the Wicca people. So there, it's just different for everyone. Mm. Mm. Yeah, the Vikings had a whole set, and the Greeks had a set, and the Romans updated the Greek set, and yeah. I think the gods of today, not the one we serve, people are afraid of them mm. and have to appease them. Mm. We're to love our God, not mm. be afraid of him. Well, and the early gods were very much a, a source of fear. <coughs> Excuse me. We're actually, after the new year, I don't know exactly the schedule, but we're going to be doing a, a study at 3 o'clock on Sundays to be announced when it starts. We're going to look at superstition, witchcraft, the occult, and God. And not, not the way you think. It's not going to be a... It's going to be new. But we're, we're going to talk about fear and how and idols. We're going to talk about idols, but that's for later. That's anyone else talk about gods and what they were like and and what what we've experienced before or or learned about. So generally, you had two different kinds of religion. You either have polytheistic religions or monotheistic religions, which means they either worship one deity or multiple deities. And most of the monotheistic religions are going to have gods that represent different aspects of their life as a way for them to explain what's going on in their world. Hmm. Hmm. So gods that, that kind of use to explain, trying to understand and make sense of what we're experiencing and what we're living. Absolutely. And, and we're going to touch on mono, monotheism a little bit here. But. And a lot of the gods were designed by government for control. Mm. Some of them, yeah. I mean, uh, in Egypt, it was all around Pharaoh. And uh, Pharaoh himself was a god, and that's why you better follow your leader. All right, well, these are good, good discussion, good thought. And uh, it's interesting if you think about, uh, you know, we talked about the, the Greek and Roman gods, of course, and the, the, the Viking gods are similar um, as far as being very, um, very human-like in many cases. They, they had human weaknesses, they had human uh, failings, but the one thing you always have to do is serve them. And as you look at uh, whenever we've created gods, including when people have gone into the Bible and used the Bible to be a guide for religion, um, it's always, and some of you brought this up, it's always a God that needs to be served and pleased and satisfied. And even, uh, so like um, one of the major world religions of our day is Islam, and Islam uh, believes in the God of Abraham, which we're going to be looking at today, but their understanding of how they relate to the God of Abraham is again that you need to please him. And uh, those who are the, the most... Uh, radical or the, the most uh, f fierce uh, interpreters of what it means to please uh, God. The, the Arabic word for God is Allah, and so they, they say Allah, um, but that's just another language for God. But that you have to even, even defeat the enemies of God, and that will earn you favor, and that's why they're so, they're so devout, which, you know, we say, oh, you know, we, we, we don't like them because we're the the enemies for them, but like if oftentimes when we say, well, we need to really fight for God, we go, Amen, Hallelujah, and they would say, Yeah, right with you, and you're like, No, 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 not you. Um, but it's this idea of, Hey, I need to, I'm going to earn God's favor by doing what He wants me to do, 
And so that's religion, and that's God's. So we're going to look at Genesis this morning, and I'm, that was the reading, but I'm just going to go straight to the introduction of our series here, God Shows Up. So Christmas time, that we're coming into the season of Christmas, is uh, where we celebrate Emmanuel, and some of our songs have Emmanuel in the words. Uh, and Emmanuel is one of the names given to Jesus, given to the Messiah. Um, and the name, meaning of that name is God with us. And so that name comes around big time at Christmas because that's when he came to live with us, came and physically came to dwell with us as a human being. And so we talk about that. So there's this idea because this is very significant because all these different religions all like, here's how you get to God. Here's how you get God's favor. Here's how you keep God happy. Here's how you get to God. And then Emmanuel is not you getting to God. It's God coming to you. And so this is very different. It's a very different approach. Now, a lot of times, and sometimes even good, what I would call good Baptist or good Bible preachers, sometimes we have this perception and are taught this perception that, you know, kind of God in the Old Testament was kind of mad. Like the God of the Old Testament's kind of ticked, he's kind of mean, he's kind of, and then Jesus comes along and it's like good PR, they're like, well, deploy Jesus because people don't think, you know, and so Jesus comes in and kind of puts a nicer face on God and suddenly like, oh, okay, now God is love, but in the Old Testament, God was mad, and that's just not true, but a lot of us, that's our perception because that's what we've been taught. Now, are there some rough parts of the Old Testament? Absolutely, there's some rough parts of the New Testament. But what we're going to see is that this entire series that runs through Christmas Eve, the, tw the morning of the 24th, this entire series is going to look at that the God that you see in Jesus is in the Old Testament. So all five weeks, we're going to limit ourselves to Genesis and Exodus. You can't get much Old, Test more tes old Testament y than that, right? And so we're going to spend all five weeks in Genesis and Exodus and look at how God has revealed himself and we'll see that it's the exact same God that you see in Jesus. And that's what we're going to study and look at. And so with that, we're going to turn to Genesis 16. And uh, the, most of these passages that we're going to go over the next, at least the next three weeks, if, like me, you grew up in this, you went to Sunday school and VBS, or you had a children's Bible at home, a lot of these stories you're going to be familiar with. And what I find is these stories that I am familiar with because I grew up with them, I read them now and I go, you know what, I missed entire parts of this. Or it was taught so simply that part of it was like taught poorly. This one will be fun. Let's look at it. Genesis 16. Now, now uh, all through here, it's Sarai and Abram. Later, their names will be changed to Sarah and Abraham. We're not going to get into that today. Same people, all right? Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, and she had an Egyptian maid whose name was Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, Now behold, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Please go in to my maid. Perhaps I shall obtain children through her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. After Abram had lived ten years in the land of Canaan, Abram's wife Sarai took Hagar the Egyptian, her maid, and gave her to her husband Abram as his wife. Just kind of a recap. He went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her sight. Hagar looked at Sarai and was like, Ugh. And Sarai said to Abraham, May the wrong done me be upon you. I gave my maid into your arms, but when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her sight. May the Lord judge between you and me. But Abram said to Sarai, Behold, your maid is in your power. Do to her what is good in your sight. So Sarai treated her harshly, and she fled from her presence. Now the angel of the Lord... Well, we'll stop there for a minute. We'll, we'll, we'll dig this as we go. All right, so that's, that was the original reading of what the, the Scripture reading would have been this morning. So let's do a little background here of what we're reading. So it said the Hagar is... The Hagar is Sarai's maid. We could also say it's a concubine for Abraham, or it's, she's a slave girl, and she's from Egypt. All right? Now, they're living, now it says that at this point they're living in the land of Canaan, so they've left um, Mesopotamia, they've left the Chaldeans, and they've gone over to 
what's modern day Israel, Palestine area, and they've, some along the line here, acquired this slave girl named Hagar. And Sarah, Sarah can't have kids. And this is a big deal, especially in this culture, because the blessing of God was understood as primarily coming through being married and then having kids. That's how you got honor. That's how you got a legacy. And for a, a, a man, that's how, you, that's how you saw that God was with you. And so not being able to have kids, whoo, this is bad. But, hey, not to fear, there's, we have contingency plans in place. In this case, we today would call it surrogacy, where, okay, you can, we'll get my slave girl pregnant. And notice what Sarai says here in um, verse 2, perhaps I shall obtain children through her. Because how this would have worked is if Hagar gets pregnant, because Hagar is just, as far as they're concerned, just an extension of Sarah. Hagar's not really her own person. She's a slave. She doesn't have any rights. She's barely even, they, they don't see her the same way. So if she gets pregnant, it's not her kid. It's Abraham and Sarah's kid. And the child would be considered Sarah's kid. And so that's why this seems like a good idea, because one way or the other, I'm having a kid. Just sleep with her. And then she gets pregnant, and we're good to go. The problem is, is it doesn't work out that way in practice, because, so... First, of course, Hagar is not protected by any legal or societal standard. There's no society. The society this is a nomadic culture. They live in tents. They, they don't, you know, they, they live roaming. And that whole culture would not be like, oh, she's a slave. She doesn't have any rights. They don't care about her. She's disposable. Doesn't matter what happens to her. And there's, so there's no legal standard. There's no societal standard. Hagar's on her own. And if she has a kid, it's not even hers. So we see this play out because so then she gets pregnant and she's like, hey, you, got, I, you can't get pregnant and I can. And so she kind of starts giving the stink eye to Sarah of, hey, I get more honor than you. But Sarah's still the wife. So Sarah's the one with the husband. So Sarah's got the honor. But Hagar feels she has the honor. And Sarah is not appreciating Hagar's attitude because Hagar, Hagar is kind of like, hey, I could have a kid when you couldn't. <laughs> I think God loves me more than you. Whatever's going on. And these two, it is not good. It is not good. Now notice, and then it gets better. So it's not good. And then Sarah blames Abraham. You catch that? Verse 5, Sarah said to Abraham, may the wrong done me but be upon you. This is your fault. Okay. I mean, yes, in one sense, you're right. On the other hand, B, wasn't this your idea? But she doesn't like how it's gone out. And then, so this is bad. This is just ugly, okay? It's, this is a bad environment. We'd call it a toxic environment. It's just, there's just, and then it's going to get even worse. Now, this is going to be our other problem here because we grew up with these stories, and when we were taught these stories, the other thing that many of us were taught these stories, we learned these stories, and these people were presented to us as the Old Testament biblical heroes. And Abraham is the hero. And we look at these Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and these, these guys, and, and Moses, and they're the heroes. And so then when uh, Hebrews 11 talks about them, we say, oh, this is the hall of faith, and these are the heroes. And we turn them into heroic characters in their story. And we're like, oh, look at the heroes. I want to be like Abraham. I want to be like Moses. I want to be like Daniel in the lion's den. All right, we, they're heroes. Now, the, the problem is, is they are not presented as heroes. They are not heroes. There's only one hero in the whole Bible. And it's not Abraham. It's not David. It's not Moses. It's Jesus. And he's the only hero all the way through the Bible. And you'll see this now because we have this very bad situation, okay? It's bad. It's about to get worse. Verse 6, because Sarah is like turning up the heat on Abraham. This is your problem. And Abraham's solution is, Abraham said to Sarah, Behold, your maid is in your power. Do to, her, do to her what is good in your sight. So Sarah treated her harshly. Abraham says, well, take it out on her. Gives her permission to abuse her. There's your hero. None of this is good, and it's not supposed to be. If you read this as heroic, it becomes deeply problematic because you're like, that's awful. Yes, 
was then, is now. It's not because we have modern sensibilities that now have reinterpreted this. No, this is bad, and when they wrote it, it was written for you to understand this is a bad situation. And Abraham said, hey, take it out on her. In other words, don't take it out on me, abuse her. Why? She's just a slave girl. It's so bad that Hagar takes off. So we have the conflict, jealousy, and strife. So Hagar takes off. And in verse 7, Now the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, by the spring on the way to Shur. All right, now the angel of the Lord. Now the word angel is just a modern translation of the word messenger. The word angel just means messenger. There are some places in the New Testament where men are called angels. It just means a messenger. Like I'm here bringing a message today, so I'd be an angel. Bing. No. Um, and there are angels that show up that are, that are divine beings, that are spiritual beings, like Gabriel and Michael and different angels that show up. And they are oftentimes called an angel of the Lord, a messenger of God. But then there is this one messenger that shows up repeatedly in the Old Testament. And when this messenger shows up, he is designated differently. He's not ever called an angel of the Lord, a messenger. He's called the messenger of the Lord, the angel of the Lord. And this angel, this messenger, displays unique characteristics that none of the others do. Many of the angels come and say, the Lord says this, the Lord says this. I bring a message from the Lord, he says this, thus says the Lord. The angel, the angel of the Lord, when he shows up, oftentimes he doesn't say the Lord says, he says, I say. He'll speak in the first person. He also will accept worship. Oftentimes when these glowy beings or these beings would show up, people would try to worship them. And when an angel of the Lord showed up and people tried to worship him, they'd say, don't. When the angel of the Lord shows up, he accepts worship. At one point, he accepts a sacrifice. This tells us that this is not a lesser spiritual being. This is God. This is God appearing to people in a personal way. This is the second person of the Trinity who later will be named Jesus. This is the second person of the Trinity. This is Yahweh. So this angel of the Lord that appears is, is, for all intents and purposes, it's Jesus. Now, he doesn't have a physical body yet. He hasn't been born of Mary yet, so he does not have flesh and blood, but he can still appear as a, as a human. Other angels did as well. So, and, and watch as you see this, and you'll hear that this person speaks as God. He said, verse 8, he said, Hagar, Sarah's maid. Now, no he knows who she is, Sarah's maid. Where have you come from, and where are you going? And it's not because he doesn't know. This is him connecting with her. And she said, I am fleeing from the presence of my mistress, Sarai. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit yourself to her authority. <sighs> now, if we stop there, this is a terrible story. Go back. I know she's treating you so badly that you felt it was better to risk your life living in the wilderness as a single pregnant, unguarded woman. But you should go back. Now, this is probably really good advice in the sense of she's probably going to die if she doesn't go back. But still, we're like, God, really? Go back to the abuse? And if the story stopped there, but then it doesn't stop there. Verse 10, moreover, but wait, there's more. The angel of the Lord said to her, I, no, it's first person, I will greatly multiply your descendants so that they shall be too many to count. The angel of the Lord said to her further, Behold, you are with child, and you shall bear a son, and you shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has given heed to your affliction. He says, All right, I'm going to, I want you to return to submit, but I want to give you a blessing. He says, Your descendants. Now, God had told Abraham that. Your descendants will be as numerous as the stars in the sky or the sand on the seashore. So Abraham had been promised this. So this is the promise that was originally given to Abraham because this is his kid. But remember, this kid would have been, would have been assumed to be his kid and Sarah's kid, even though Sarah's rejected the mom now. But he doesn't say, I am now blessing Abraham. What does he say now? He's taking the Abrahamic blessing, but now he's giving it specifically to Hagar. 
He doesn't say Abraham's descendants. He says in verse 10, your descendants. Now, giving her a legacy would have been unheard of in that culture. Why? Because she's a woman. And she's not even a wife. She's a slave. For him to say, I'm going to give you this whole myriad of descendants? What? He couldn't, go, he couldn't be going harder against the culture of the time if he tried. A, it would be a man, and B, it would be under very different circumstances. But he says, you, I will multiply your descendants. You will bear a son, and you will name him. Now, we know Abram later names him, but what does he name him? Ishmael. He sees her. He says of this guy in verse 12, he will be a wild donkey of a man. And the donkeys, that was a sign of immense strength. Donkeys were super strong. They were a sign of resiliency. His hand will be against everyone, and everyone's hand will be against him. And he will live to the east of his brothers. This is the, the birth of the Arab population. He says they're going to be really strong, and they're always going to be in conflict with everyone, and they're going to live east of the rest of Abraham's other kid. And that's true every day until today and still true today. If you turn on the news, what's going on? This. People say, oh, it's not true in the Bible. Right there. Your entire your, your, your news feed is, be, is a fulfillment of verse 12 of this constant conflict because very strong people who survive and who exist to this day east of their brothers. Hagar's blown away. Verse 13. Let me make sure I'm not ahead of this here. Verse, verse 11, he says, why have I done this? He says, because, verse 11, the Lord has given heed. It means listened to. The Lord has given heed to your affliction. The Lord has paid attention to you. This is someone nobody cares about. I mean, the people who should care about her, Abram and Sarah, I mean, we saw how caring Abram was. We saw how caring Sarah was. And God says, but I, I hear you. I care about what's happening to you. I pay attention to you. So verse 13, then she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. And notice, she realizes she's, she's met with God here. You are a God who sees. For she said, have I even remained alive after seeing him? And so she says, oh. and the, the word can mean he sees me. It also can mean he looks out for me. Same, same word, to look out for. And it's not just that, I saw, that he saw me. I saw him. And again, their, their concept of God was, you can't see God, you'll die. Which, if any of us saw Yahweh, it would overwhelm us in his, in his fullness. But here, Yahweh has appeared to her. That's what Jesus is. Jesus is, the part, Jesus is God revealing himself in a ways we can ha handle so that we would know him. And she goes, I saw him, and he saw me. Whoa. And this blows her mind because she had never encountered God that way because nobody taught God that way because that's not how humans make up God ever. The God who saw me, and I was able to see him. So let's unpack this, because the setting, the setting's a mess. A big mess based on a lot of bad human choices. I mean, we start with slavery, forced surrogacy, jealousy, abuse. So that's pretty bad. Well, that's very bad. So it's a bad situation, a lot of bad human choices. But now let's back up a, even a bigger step. Why are you having all these bad human choices? Well, what was the origin of these bad human choices? Abram and Sarah had been told that, they would, that God was going to give them a child and that this child would be their blessing. And through this child, they would experience the blessing of God to all the nations. But they, she can't have kids. And so what do they decide? Okay, I know God is going to bless me, but I have to figure out how to do that. 
I have to solve the riddle of how do I get God's blessing. I know, let's try this. Did God tell them to do that? No. So they are refusing to trust God. They're refusing to obey God. And then that creates an incredibly unhealthy, toxic situation. But even the situation, as bad as it is, is a result of other bad things, like not trusting God and disobeying Him. So this is a terrible situation, a big lack of trust and obedience. Again, Abraham is not a hero in the story because even going along with this is totally going against God's plan for Abraham. And then God steps in, and think about who he steps in with. Hey, Christ, not even Hebrew. She's not related to Abram. She's Egyptian. And all through the Bible, Egypt is a stand-in for being outside God's will. Egypt is where you go because you're in trouble. And this woman's from there. So she is not a candidate for God's favor in any way. She has no social status, no legal status, nationality. She's all wrong. And God sees her. He looks out for her. And he blesses her. Whew. And this is different. A different from any conception of God in any of those cultures of that day or any culture since. We do not create gods like this. We never have. Our gods that we create are remarkably similar, even when they're different. Even the ones that, like in Buddhism or Hinduism, where God isn't a person, he's a force, he's a set of principles and cosmic realities. But there's still, like karma, well, what's the whole thing of karma? If you do the right thing, you'll go up. If you do the bad thing, you go down. It's the same thing. Just because God's not personal, the rules don't change. So whether it's the God of Islam whether it's the God of Hinduism or Buddhism or the God of religious Christianity, it's do the right thing, you go up, do the wrong thing, you go down. Now, these guys couldn't be doing more wrong if they tried. And God steps into this with a person who has nothing to offer. Her situation reflects a lack of trust and obedience in God and an actual deviation from what God commanded and he blesses her. And that blessing is still showing up on your news every day. This is a woman nobody cared about. And thousands of years later, you know her name. And you see the results of her, the power of her child on your news every day. Still shaping our world. Which to them... Can you imagine going back and say, Hagar, thousands of years from now, 5,000 years from now, your kids will still be making the news. Who am I? Well, you're nobody. You're a slave girl that nobody cares about. But God saw her and says, I'll give you a legacy. You will never be forgotten. I see you. Whew. Why? Because she's special? Nope. That's how good God is. That's the God that shows up later and Jesus says, you guys, aren't, you guys aren't good, but I am, and I love you. I see you. I hear you. This is the God that reveals himself in the Bible again and again because the gods we create require. Here's what you need to do. And the God of the Bible responds with an offer. Here's what I'm going to do. He responds to human evil with merciful, graceful, good. It would, we would be hard-pressed to conduct, to con concoct a more ugly scenario than the beginning of Genesis 16. It's just foul. And God's response to this mixture of disobedience, lack of trust, and then bad behavior is to step in and care for this woman and bless her. That's a different God than we tend to make. He sees the poor. He sees the victimized. He sees the downcast. 
this is the God who will later come and be born among us, and his name will be called Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we, we're constantly worried about whether we're good enough, and we oftentimes either begin to arrogantly think we could be good enough, or we pretty much know we aren't. But we constantly kind of reinterpret you into a traditional human-made God where if we don't measure up, if we don't straighten up and fly right, that we will not earn your favor, earn your blessing, earn your mercy, earn your grace, because you're a rewarder after we've acted. Yet, Lord, we see right here that in the situation where she's not one of your people, and the entire situation is ugly, and you stepped in to see this poor young lady and to say, I will, I see you, and I hear you, and I care about your suffering. Lord, help us to remember that's the God that loves us, that that's you, not the God of our making, not the God of our creation, where we earn your favor, where we try to make you proud of us the God who cares about us because you're good, not because we are, that comes with us not on the basis of our situation, but despite our situation. And so, Lord, as we are unfaithful, as we are unworthy, as we make terrible choices and make big messes, that we can come to you, not on the basis of our goodness, but on the basis of yours. And, uh, Lord, that is why you came and died on the cross to finish your accomplishment of goodness because we couldn't accomplish it. May we understand how deeply you love us. It doesn't make sense. What wondrous love of this, that you would do this, that you would care for us in our rebellion and our disobedience. Father, be with us throughout this series and out through this season as we prepare to celebrate your coming to earth in human form but as we understand that this is who you are. Thank you, Father. It doesn't make sense, but we just have to trust you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So stand and sing this awesome song, Come All You Unfaithful.
Christ is just a Latin word for Messiah, Savior. He's the Messiah. He's the one who came to save you. My favorite part of that song is where it says, come see what your God has done. Because what do we say again and again? What do I need to do? What do I need to do? What do I need to do? Am I doing enough? What do I need to do? But it says, come see what your God has done. Hagar did nothing. God blessed her. We come on the basis of his work, not ours. We come and yield our lives to him and our efforts to be good. We give up. Our efforts to define our lives, we give up. Our efforts to seize control of our lives, we give up because he has given us his love and allowed us to be called his own if we will merely accept his gift. Father, as we go from here, may we live this. May it be what we remember. May we remember that we live in your grace and mercy. And so that while being good is good, we are good because we are loved, because we have been forgiven, because we have been accepted by your shed blood. And so, Lord, our motivation is not to earn your pleasure, but to live in it, to understand that your life is better than ours and our efforts to define ourselves like Abraham and Sarah, even though they were trying to get your blessing, but doing it in their own terms created a terrible, toxic, ugly, hurtful mess, which is what we do, even when we're trying to seek you, but on our own terms. So, Lord, we yield to you, and then, Lord, help us to bring that good news out into this world, a world right now torn apart by everybody's effort to be right everybody's effort to get their way, everybody's effort to get their blessing. Lord, may we go out as ministers of this peace and love and mercy and grace that they would come and find their rest in you because of what you have done on the cross, dying for our sins. Thank you, Father. Dismiss us in your peace today. In Jesus' name, amen.